So a very good afternoon, morning and evening to all. I'm Priya Balasubramaniam, a public health and health system scientist affiliated with the Public Health Foundation of India and the Center for Sustainable Health Innovations here in Singapore. On behalf of our partners, the Institute of Development Studies, Sussex, Ikigai Law, New Delhi and Transform Health, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the mutual learning series on digital health ecosystems. The objective of this uh, digital di dialogue series is to examine evolving digital health interventions through a health systems lens to better understand and prepare for more inclusive, integrated and accountable digital health models during and beyond the pandemic. Today's digital dialogue will focus on matters of accountability, regulatory frameworks for driving safe digital healthcare adoption in India. Our panelists will discuss how an ideal legal and regulatory framework would look like that brings out the rights and liabilities of all stakeholders concerned, and also how sound regulatory architecture has the potential to influence and impact health outcomes in a positive way. The format of today's roughly 85 minute session will involve a five to six minute presentation by Ikigai that touches on three key issues under various laws, the telemedicine practice guidelines of 2020, the medical devices regulation and health data, followed by opening remarks from each panelist that will segue onto a broader discussion on what they see as key issues that need to be resolved to safely integrate digital health tools in healthcare delivery and access. We do encourage audience interaction, so please feel free to ask questions during the session via the Q&A option on your screen, as well as the chat option. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers of the session and the moderator for today's session. We have Dr. K. Madan Gopal. Dr. Gopal is a public health professional working on issues related to health systems reform and strengthening in India for over three decades. He's currently a senior consultant health at the Niti Ayo the National Institution for Transforming India, the APEX policy think tank for the government of India and contributes to various transformative health sector programs, including the National Digital Health Mission and the COVID pandemic response. We next have Dr. Uma Nambiar. Dr. Nambiar is the CEO of Dalmia Healthcare and the managing director of ZDN Life Sciences. She's also chairperson of the Digital Health India Association. She's a trained neurosurgeon and health system specialist with expertise in strategic planning, healthcare policy design, healthcare quality monitoring, and the use of information technology in healthcare. A passionate believer in digital health systems being an enabler for accessible, ethical, and affordable healthcare, she devotes considerable amount of time and energy to promote its implementation at all levels in the health ecosystem. And finally, we have UB Care Health, represented by Mr. Sridhar, Pilalamari. Mr. Pilalamari is the CEO and co-founder of UBK Health Private Limited. He has held global leadership positions in various organizations over the last 33 years. UBK Health is a startup that has been recognized in enabling specialized medical care to patients at home. <laughs> UBK uses digital health, telemedicine, and collaborative workflows to build hybrid healthcare pathways that extend secondary and tertiary care away from hospitals. Prior to founding UBCare, he was managing director of Max Linear India. And finally, I would like to hand over the session to our moderator for the day, Ms. Srinidhi Srinivasan. Ms. Srinis Ms. Srinivasan is the principal associate at Ikigai Law. She comes with a deep focus on technology law and strong policy advisory backgrounds. She is engaged with a diverse set of stakeholders in the technology and policy ecosystem, including governments, ministries, as well as companies. At Ikigai, she focuses on data governance, health technology, and e-commerce. And finally, my co-facilitator for this series, Professor Jerry Bloom, who is a fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, University of Sussex, and he will wrap up with closing remarks at the end of the session. Over to you, Srinidhi. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Priya. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, it's great to be here with this wonderful panel of speakers today. 
uh, Dr. Gopal, Dr. Nambiar, Mr. Sridhar, thank you so much for joining us and I'm really looking forward to uh, this conversation. Uh, thanks also for that introduction, uh, Dr. Priya. I think at, at Ikiga Law, we have a sharp focus on uh, law, uh, technology and, and innovation and health has been a key area of focus for us and we've been following this space closely for the past couple of years. Um, and our goal today is to really dig into the legal landscape for digital health across a couple of themes and, and get our panelists thoughts on it. Uh, we've seen an explosion of digital tools and, and platforms in the healthcare delivery space and we expect more and more of that in, in the coming years, especially with uh, the government's policy initiatives around digital health, like the Ayushman Bharat Digital Health Mission and, and several other initiatives. Um, and at this stage where we're anticipating a massive uh, rise in scale, we really hope to understand the successes of our current regulatory system and, and pitfalls and, and potential challenges. Uh, there's a really wide range of laws that, that addresses different aspects of health. And we'd love to hear from our panel today and on, on how these laws can best serve patient outcomes while also ensuring accountability and, and also enabling innovation. Uh, and we hope that the takeaways from this session can lead into uh, further discourse on, on what the law and policy framework should, should look like. I'll just do a very quick overview of the laws that we hope to dig into across uh, three big uh, themes. And after that overview, I'll, I'll invite our speakers for their opening remarks. Um, so digging right in, there is, there is of course a varied set of stakeholders and, and a range of tech tools and, and platforms that have emerged in this space. Um, we see specialized platforms for telemedicine and for healthcare delivery as also general communication tools that are used or adopted by doctors and patients to interact. Uh, we see specialized healthcare products uh, that, are, that support physicians in, in diagnostics and post-op care or for mon monitoring patients. Uh, we see direct to, uh, direct to sort of consumer products, a plethora of apps and, and wearables that, that track calories you consume, track your heartbeat, menstrual cycles, or, or allow you to journal your mental health. Um, and there are multiple stakeholders involved. There are platform developers, those involved, uh, service providers in, in the chain that focus on, say, AI, ML solutions, physicians, practitioners, and allied healthcare professionals. And, and there are laws governing each of those segments. And we'll just show a brief sort of snapshot across the uh, spectrum of, of these laws for telecom, for telemedicine, for healthcare products, for health data, and, and for... Uh, professionals and and we hope to really dig into three big big themes for today um first is telemedicine i think in 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 march of 2020 close to around two years back when the pandemic had just begun the government had notified the telemedicine practice guidelines um this was much needed a much needed sort of formal recognition of the practice of telemedicine um, but the guidelines were more of a starting point. They left a lot of the details up to the doctors who were to decide the, the choice of platform, which platform would be most ideal for um, using or for interacting with a patient, whether a specialized tool or a general chat over, over phone or, or WhatsApp. Um, it left it up to the doctors to sort of also decide whether a teleconsult will be the right way forward. It prescribed a set of uh, medicines that, that doctors could prescribe, um, depending on whether it's the first consult or if it's a follow-up consult, or and a set of medicines that you simply cannot prescribe through a telemedicine uh, mechanism. Um, and importantly for tech platforms, it, it set out a list of do's and don'ts. Uh, which are also fairly uh, bare bones. Um, I, I understand the most important of these could be that uh, AI platforms and AI cannot directly counsel patients or cannot directly prescribe medicines. It's, it's, uh, it can definitely, an AI tool can definitely supplement or support a doctor in, in diagnosis or, or in post-op care. Um, and there again, this theme of kind of shifting the onus onto the physicians and the, and the doctors. Um, now that we're at this two-year mark, we're close to it, it being sort of two years of the guidelines. Um, and perhaps there's a need to kind of examine what more can be done in this space, how have the guidelines enabled, and, and, and what are the sort of restrictions and challenges that have sprung up along the way. 
Um, the second big theme um, that we hope to discuss is, is just on healthcare products. Um, beyond telemedicine and, and telecommunication, there are several other uh, products, specialized health products that have emerged in the market. And um, central to all of these perhaps has been the idea of, of, of building trust to ensure that these are safe for use by doctors and patients, that these enhance patient outcomes, um, that these are evaluated and, and, and serve the cause for which, for which they were developed. And a couple of years back, uh, within the regime of the Drugs and Cosmetics Act um, and, and the medical devices framework, the government also notified that uh, standalone softwares and accessories that, that aid diagnostics or treatment or, or care, cure of a disease could also be classified as, as medical devices. And based on the level of risk associated with a tech platform or a software function, like with any other medical device, they may also undergo a registration or a vetting process going forward an approval uh, process as well, um, which, which would involve reaching out to the CDSCO at the central level or the state drug controller authorities. Um, and a couple of questions that, that come up here are what could be the evaluation process that, that we follow for an AI ML tool that is uh, used in a clinical setting? What do we need to calibrate that for a, for a, a clinical, clinical sort of framing? Um, and and the, the idea that medical devices and in particular software functions, uh, whether they should continue to be regulated under the ages or the umbrella framework of the Drugs and Cosmetics Act. Um, and the third big theme um, that we hope to discuss today is that of health data and health data management. Um, as we move to digital tools, increasing adoption by, by doctors as well as in, in con consumers and, and patients, there is a vast amount of sensitive health data which is, uh, which is now online, which is shared, processed, uh, collected and generated online, leaving behind a digital footprint as well. Um, and, and how that data is managed uh, does play a key role in enhancing patient rights, privacy being one, one among them, privacy and, and confidentiality. Um, India is close to finalizing a sta its comprehensive standalone data protection law um, under which health data is, is recognized as sensitive uh, data. Uh, what that means is that it comes with certain heightened obligations when it comes to how you take consent from users when it comes to health data, um, where that data can be stored, uh, what are the kinds of other recommended, other sort of requirements around uh, how do you design a product in a way that is privacy protective and, and, and so on. Um, in parallel, the under the digital health mission, under the government's um, Ayushman Bharat Digital Health Mission uh, and the National Health Authority, there is a health data management uh, program, which, which also there is a push to develop some kind of standards for, for, for health data in particular. So here also would, would love to understand and, and get our panelists' thoughts on how do we leverage existing laws and standards? How do we, what are our hopes when it comes to the data protection law and, and these different regulators also that will be set up or that, that are currently existing in, in, in the framework? Um, I think with, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pause and, and I'll invite our speakers to uh, uh, come in with their opening remarks. Uh, perhaps if I could come first to uh, Dr. Gopal. Um, Dr. Gopal, the government has made a big push towards uh, digital health. It's been a key area of focus in the past couple of years and several of these initiatives have been conceptualized and led by Niti Aayog's vision. Um, and I'd invite you to share your thoughts on the government's vision, the current sort of set of challenges and, and upcoming priorities uh, when it comes to ensuring safe digital healthcare uh, delivery. First of all, I accept my thanks uh, for uh, giving this opportunity to share my thoughts and views uh, regarding uh, the digital mission. You have rightly mentioned uh, that the telemedicine practice guidelines, which were released in 2020, has been a game changer for uh, the digital health. But nevertheless, uh, we should understand that uh, how these telemedicine practice guidelines came into existence. When the country went into lockdown uh, during the month of March, there were a lot of people who were comorbid and they required follow-up care. And the honorable courts have taken a cognizance of whatever teleconsults, whatever WhatsApp chart and other uh, modes of electronic communication. They have taken a cognizance of that. And uh, many of the people were paralyzed based on that. 
to enable that thing we thought that ki we should push for his guidelines and fortunately at that time uh, niti ayog was having a advantageous position with the, our member being the chair of the board of governors of aswan uh, mci we, we both push for the uh, this uh, telemedicine guidelines so it can enable the people and can result in continuum of care of this people co morbid people to see that having uh, said this uh, we have opened a door for uh, innovations challenges usually results in innovation and it has proven that you have seen that it ha- it was only meant for catering the follow up patients who for whom the hospitals were closed so all the hospitals were dedicated towards covid management to cater to that now you see that how this uh, thing this innovation this practice guidelines have resulted in a home based care, care management it has given confidence because uh, if i were supposed to do a tele consult i don't know whether the court will allow it or not but this tele medicine guideline they have facilitated it has been a game changer and it is going to be a game changer in the coming days also so one thing it is evolving we have to see that how we standardize it how we make a uh, see the quality of the tele consult which is happening it's evolving thing that's why the good uh, perfect should not be the enemy of good we worked on that high level principle so we started it so we opened it and we have seen that the confidence is there home based management of the care is, has happened apart from that the digital devices were there which has aided in the home care management and that's why with a limited uh, health infrastructure we could manage uh, this pandemic till now and in the current way also with the majority of the people they are getting treatment at homes this telemedicine practice guideline as well as the digital aid in the form of digital thermometer every household now would be having a digital thermometer then you are having a pulse oximeter otherwise it was very difficult to monitor the oxygen saturation in a patient this compounded with teleconsultation the setting up the command center in that way it has revolutionized the management of the covid care as but the journey has not been from now only the effort started uh, right from the 2011 when the clinical establishment act was enacted in which electronic health records were mandated and some efforts have also started from that if you look at the landscape of the ministry's program we are providing health care services to each and every individual who who are sort of to the system to the private sector to the public sector in the public sector you are having many programs to cater to the different needs if somebody is uh, getting services under malaria program the malaria program would be having that information somebody from the disease surveillance program the idsp program would be having that so we thought that ki if a similar data is collected for a single person why can't we have an integrated so integration steps towards integration started uh, in, during the early quarters of this uh, uh, around 2010 11 then you have found that the integrated health information platform rolled out in which all the modules can write and with a common identifier you can these programs can talk to each other so that you can have a individual level data from the different programs and you can analyze and see what kind of uh, data is available for that particular thing when the and and this uh, uh, when the ayushman bharat because after the uh, when the uh, uh, one more impetus was given when the during the rsb by days when we have we have used the smart card for uh, doing the transaction that has also given confidence that we can further leap frog and use a different kind of technology for using this kind of modules when ayushman bharat pmg program was launched we thought that let us adopt the systems which are available then we can have a pmg 2.0 version and simultaneously we can make a health stack the whole of the journey of the digital nation related with the, having a health stack we thought that we should be having a health stack and in this health stack with a common identifier all the program all the data can be talked to each other with that mission the national digital blueprint was made which forms an architecture for the mission in the country and 
through that you you might have seen that uh, how the things are moving last year the national digital health mission was rolled out uh, and uh, the first objective is to see that uh, how we have uh, the digital id for the doctor digital id for the institution and digital id for the patient that is the electronic health record for the patient and as the scheme evolves as the things are evolving we don't know you can't be having perfect solution for everything we started with six things now the covin has been also adopted by this thing with the covin coming in in a big way for management of the vaccination program in this anybody who using a aadhar based identification in covin automatically electronic health record is being created for that person so that kind of facility is there so that means if somebody has used it so many electronic health records are being created now the challenge is that how to use this electronic health records off like i just cite an example that uh, regarding the data privacy and other things in india who is bothered about the data privacy i don't know i uh, yesterday i brought something i have to provide all my aadhar pan number everything they have taken it there was no question if i don't provide it i will not get the stuff which i i want it was a big purchase i have to provide everything there is no nothing like that but once it comes to the health electronic health records and the electronic medical records these are two segments which uh, the digital mission is working as the things will evolve in the coming days you will find lot of integration between the all the aspect because one way you are digitalizing the ids of the doctors the other is digitalizing the institution then you are digitalizing the patient records the other program the integrated health information platform that is also collecting information from the 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 rural areas and the other programs now when the aishwar bharat the pmj was conceptualized it was having two arms one was the health and wellness centers the other was the pmj which was after the secondary and the tertiary the primary care element that's a gate keepers which they call in the western parlay they that information is coming from health and wellness center and in the coming days you will be seeing that both these programs will talk to each other and the individual records will be used in it is 2035 documents for health surveillance also we have advocated the use of the electronic health records for monitoring the individual health records so in the coming days you will be listening lot about this thing the medical device bill and other things as the, the questions will come i will be answering to that but i will stop here so over to you please thank you thank you so much uh, dr gopal for that i think several themes to pick on there from privacy to to access across the rural urban divide as well and i'll come back to you with 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 a follow up set of questions but i'd like to invite uh, next perhaps dr uh, nambiar um to to make her opening remarks with with your experience in in digital health over the past several years any any sort of big successes that you'd want to highlight challenges pitfalls with with the regulatory system and and yeah with the policies uh, dr nandya yeah thank you so much uh, shriniti so uh, let me uh, pick up from dr you know a little bit from dr where dr gopal has left and mainly i would like to speak on the tpg guidelines whereas you know telemedicine has been in india over the last 17 uh, or nearly 20 years but it never really became popular and it was never legal to really practice uh, telemedicine and there was no way that you could actually charge fee for it and because you could not monetize it it never became popular so tpg guidelines made one thing possible which fearlessly allowed doctors to consult on a through a telecommunication medium so yes as a crisis management um, tool when the guidelines were formulated and telemedicine was used it really created a comfort of use of digital health for the patient as well as for the doctor because fear for life you know being in the same physical space prevented us and actually promoted the use of distant and remote telemedicine which is a great thing that happened in fact i would say one of the best thing that happens in covid is promotion of digital health having said that telemedicine guidelines you know the way they are the tpg guidelines what was formulated in march 2020 fall way short of what is your requirement because it is very rudimentary you know it says consent management there is no clarity supposing i'm going to do a telephone consultation with you how are you going to take my consent and how are you going to record it right so some of those things are not there the drugs that you can prescribe the clarity 
is uh, not there. How long would you keep a record? It says that every uh, consultation has to be recorded and kept. How long, in what format, how much storage is required? There is no clarity. So the people who practice it today also are practicing it in the way they understand it. Now, there was also, you know, because whenever there is chaos and there is an opportunity, a lot of people come up with solutions. So you have a lot of people who came up with telemedicine solutions. You know, there were a lot of applications and many of them, we assessed many of them to create a telemedicine registry so that it could, you know, people could know where to, it's like a one-stop shop for where you look for a telemedicine solution. We found many developers did not know anything about the guidelines. They don't know that there is a guidelines that they have to adhere to. They have to provide for identification of patient. They have to provide for identification of, they had no clue. Similarly, now when you practice in telemedicine, you could be sitting in any part of the country, any part of the world, and you would do a you know, consultation, remote consultation. There is physically, if I have to consult in Kerala, I have to have Kerala Medical Council registration. When I move to Delhi, I have to have a Delhi Medical Council registration. When I move to Punjab, I have to have a Punjab Medical Council registration. Now, when you do telemedicine, I could do a cross without any registration. Right? So these kind of lack of clarity is there. And it is being mis... You know, it has a potential for misuse. Now, when you say that the patients will give consent, you know, towards we are moving in digital health towards a PHR, you know, patient control documentation, how, who's going to educate the patient how to give consent, how to give right of access to a doctor? We don't know all that. So whereas for a crisis management, the TPG guidelines were excellent, came as a savior. It created a lot of opportunities for people. But we have to understand that we are you know, embarking on a journey of digital health. We're saying that we want to make NDHM a success. Telemedicine is the basic building block for digital health. Now, if I were to say that ASHA worker is the basic, you know, the root or the, or the basic worker in a brick and mortar healthcare work model, or, you know, just next to PHC, and so is, the tele, so is telemedicine. So if you want to have a robust digital health uh, program in the country, telemedicine is the ground layer. You know, we need to make sure that the first point of data collection has to be really robust, well adapted, and guidelines have to be crystal clear. So it is time to really look at these fine print and, uh, and bring out the act. Similarly, you know, and from there we move to the PDP and all of that stuff. Really, uh, I think a lot more work has to be done, but it's a journey well begun, I would say. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for those uh, remarks, Dr. Nambiar. And I think similar themes that, I'm, that, I, that I spotted in, in, in your initial remarks as well, especially around data and privacy, and maybe we can come to a few of those and, and some of the more sort of fine print related issues in, in the next hour. Um, I'll, I'll now invite Mr. Uh, Sridhar as well uh, for his uh, opening thoughts, especially with, particularly with your experience in, in building and, and scaling up uh, UB Care, you know, connecting with multiple chains, chains, points in this healthcare delivery chain. Um, how have the laws helped? Where have they sort of not helped? Uh, and, and any other thoughts that you may? Sure. Thanks, Srinidhi. And uh, I think the opening remarks of Dr. Madan Gopal and Dr. Umar Nambiar summarizes it quite well. I will lay it out as a perspective of, uh, as a healthcare company, as a startup, our journey and where we have been. So we started in 2017, to be very clear, on September 28th. So this was pre-pandemic. It was pre the telemedicine guideline time. All the telemedicine was very well accepted by the time frame. It was pre that. So I will talk about what happened to our journey before that and what happened to journey post that. In a way, uh, capturing some of the things which already has echoed by Dr. Uman Ambiar and Dr. Madan Gopal. So we started with a journey of taking up follow-up care to patients at home, largely post-acute, post-chronic, people with serious illnesses, where we felt once a person is discharged and back, sent back home, he's seriously missing the extension of a specialist care. That's where we said, why not we actually go to telehealth care, use telehealth care. Now, we looked at from that point of view and said that we'll extend specialist care to patients at home. And when the patient is being guided by the specialist as well as a doctor, we have a combination of virtual and physical, what we call a hybrid model, where we said that, okay, this is how the care is being delivered. So pre-pandemic, in fact, in 2019 to be exact, sometime, I don't remember the exact date, 
there was a guide there was a guideline issued by the KMC which kind of banned telemedicine. That was a big blow to what we were doing in the sense that every doctor you go, they say that oh this is banned. I mean we, you really can't do this. I mean you. So we are saying, well, look, you are getting your patient outcomes. Patient outcomes are going to improve. Everything else is going to be fine. But of course, so what has happened pre-pandemic is the way people have interpreted, I mean, the guidelines, what is required for telemedicine at different states and different, was very, very difficult. Of course, the pandemic and then and the, and the form that the guidelines have indeed come did help a lot in kind of this acceptance and as this acceptance came about, it became much easier to actually say okay, how, does, how, come, how the patient outcomes can be done. In fact, we have, as a UBCare, BIDAC encouraged us in terms of saying, how can you repurpose the COVID platform? Uh, how can you repurpose your platform for COVID? And we actually delivered COVID care to patients at home with great successes. Our platform was uh, taken by St. John. We adopted it and provided telemedicine uh, to, and, and COVID support to over 2,500 plus patients. So this kind of a support really enabled. So if you look at the pre-pandemic, yeah, there was certain regulations and it was like everybody interpreting its own set of laws and how to, how to go about doing it. And post-pandemic, of course, it became easy. And it, 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 the journey kind of embarked into a mechanism how to basically take care. Now, it's just not pandemic. It's just not a mechanism of uh, what you call, uh, uh, like Dr. Wanambe pointed out, it's a telemedicine is a basic uh, element under which the entire digital healthcare is evolving around. But you can't just use it as a teleconsult. Just to uh, stop at this point, I'll, 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 I'll continue in this. If you look at a general clinical consult between a doctor and a patient, a patient walks to an OPD, the doctor actually does the consult, gives a prescription in a physical format, the records are put in some, some frames, maybe in some files, and the patient actually walks away with the prescription and buys the medication. The entire digitization is you're just replacing this physical infrastructure by a virtual one. So in, in a way, you do, the doctor is not changing, the patient is not changing. You're just bringing a new paradigm where you're just connecting them all together, right? Of course, you need other privacy, other, other policies and guidelines to actually conduct this matter in a way that it becomes efficient and the patient outcomes are indeed properly done. Now, so coming back, so when you actually look at, if you look, use telemedicine from that point of view, and you look at digital healthcare, it's not just teleconsult. Post the consult, what is happening to the patient? What are the different care flows? What are the, what are the care pathways? What are the different steps and guidelines? The feedback, what do you call the closed loop feedback, has to be managed. This, this entire flow has to get covered into the process. What has happened at this juncture of time is we have a set of guidelines for enabling this telemedicine. Of course, there are certain things which needs to be, but the practice has to go beyond this to enable the complete care, how is it being delivered to a patient at home, and how the outcomes are indeed benefiting so that entire community can work together toward the direction. So that the focus should be in the direction and I believe it is evolving and it is in the right direction. And what we need to do is that, okay, step-by-step, step, we can actually put into those practices and enable that. So the focus should be not just the telemedicine, digitized healthcare, how does the patient outcomes are indeed getting improved has to be the, the basic theme under which one has to be focused on. And I, I believe we are in the right step. And of course, a lot of things have to be, have to be done in the direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sridhar. And, and yeah, I think uh, beyond telemedicine, all of the other tools and sort of building an ecosystem around uh, where, where, like Dr. Namia said, I think a stepping stone could be telemedicine, which has given sort of like a shot in the arm to, to a lot of the digital health initiatives, but there's perhaps a lot more to, to dig into. And, and we, we hope to hear from you through the course of the session on some of the other aspects as well. Uh, but maybe if I could spend a little bit more time just on the telemedicine practice guidelines, uh, perhaps if I could if I could direct this to uh, Dr. Nambia, because I think you, you did mention that there's a lot still in the fine print itself, which can be um, enhanced or improved. Uh, perhaps maybe if you could, you could talk about some of the sort of risks that you see or in message to, to patients and more to doctors relying on mobile health applications, given, given the current set of uh, guidelines, do they place too much of an onus on physicians and doctors to be calling the shots? Um, and do they do enough to kind of apportion liability and, and ensure accountability of the tech platforms? Would, would love to hear from you on, on that. 
So not just for telemedicine, but for the entire digital health platform, when we talk about, you know, capturing electronic data and the entire breach of security, anything, where does the onus lie today? You know, the responsibility lies with the doctor or the hospital to ensure that there is no breach of security and that, you know, all that, because there is no clarity. Now, as a hospital administrator, if I buy a software solution, and there is a breach of a patient's data in that solution. The patient sues the hospital, right? And the patient, and also the concerned doctor who has captured the data. There is nothing mentioned about the technology partner, the software company. There is absolutely no guideline which says that so and so will be responsible because that is where the government needs to step in. That's where the guidelines needs to come. Because today, even if I ask a software company that okay, I'm going to audit the security features that you have put in they are not open to audit if i say that okay when my hospital is going to be audited for accreditation or anything i'm going to ask them to audit your security systems or the data storage and all that they will not subject themselves to audit it's not part of the contract so there is a big lack of understanding and there is a fear you know for for a hospital administrator or a doctor because First of all, we don't understand anything about where this breach will happen. What is this data security? Where will the data be stored? We have got zero clue about all that, right? So the knowledge is not there. And it is not really the domain of the medical fraternity to be looking at the storage of this data or the security of this data. It was different when you had a physical document and it was in the complex of the hospital. You stored that physical document in the complex of the hospital and the hospital was responsible therefore for the physical security of that document. Today, that is not so. So I think this clarity needs to be there before the hospitals and the doctors feel confident that we will not be sued for something which we have no idea of and we have no understanding of. And we also do not have any um, you know, reason to be responsible for that. You know, We are the data capturing community. Our job is to capture the data accurately and to look at the analytics and to use that analytics for better patient care. But in between, storage of data, security of data should not be something that is the held as a responsibility of the medical care provider. This is what I needed to say. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nambiar. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think you, you bring out the distinction um, as to just what all is the scope of work of, of a hospital versus a, a tech platform as well, how it's kind of different when, when it's a setting of, of this sort. And I'm wondering if, if I could ask uh, Mr. Sridhar on, um, uh, from, from the other end, you know, as a, as a tech platform that is often looking to onboard doctors, um, is there something more that can be done there, uh, perhaps some more training at the time of signing up so that doctors are also more comfortable and really understand how to handle data and how to kind of interact with the tech platform uh, better? Yeah, yeah. True, sure. I mean, it's possible. Let's see, in any platform, I mean, because, see, for, I mean for, for time being, if you remove the digital telehealth care and look at other platforms which normally are so tuned to use right now, like, for example, mobile, like, for example, the personal computer itself, like many... If actually you should look at them as tools, right? So in any platform and any specific thing, there is a usability aspect. So what we let's say call the user interface or what comes as the, from where you're actually able to use and how to basically go about. And there's a whole backend, which is actually supporting that this entire thing actually happening. Uh, I'll just deflect it for timing to finance transaction. Look at banking. All of us today are equally comfortable in using and doing online transactions. We have been trans sending money. I remember the days when I was young and uh, we really had to put checks. I was in a hostel and my father has to literally send a check which has to be put into my, into my account and then it'll go. It takes such a long time, right? Now all of us are adapted. Security, for example, there is there. Now, of course, there, like Dr. Nambia mentioned, there will be audits. There are other things which you will need to do, which, which ensures that your, your stamp with respect to that security. So the backend portion of the entire thing, which takes care of the EHR, the the basic uh, flow of uh, how the care workflow should go about and all this are residing and that provides the interface and the front end interface should be a mechanism where it should give, it should make it as easy as possible. To an extent that like we are communicating right now, I mean, why, I mean, why not? I mean, technology should be as, as easy as possible that I'm communicating right now and it should be feasible. 
However, because technology itself is an evol evolution, so today, for example, uh, some forms have to be entered, some, some mechanisms have to be put in, some login accesses will be there. To that extent, training, onboarding, everything else can easily be doable. And our goal is to ensure that the front-end interface to the medical practitioners, the doctors, whoever, we, should, we will try to make it as simple as feasible. At the same time, ensuring that the captured data and whatever information is being captured by the practitioners along the is as per the norms and guidelines and put in secure mechanism and ensuring that security is there. I remember when we were actually demonstrating this to St. John Hospital. Now in St. John Hospital, multiple doctors came with multiple queries. One specific query was with the psychiatry. Now this department says that I don't even want my other doctors to see this specific data. Can, no, can you actually make the security because it's a now in this case of situation, it's more like a patient doctor thing I really need, need to be 100% secure. So now we have to come back with some sort of a mechanism. We still have not come with, we are not set, given up that solution, but we have to form, formulate some sort of a wall. Now the problem is, next question is, in the event that the doctor really lives St. John, now how does this data become available to some other person who's going to take over so that those practices have to be put in. So technically, from a technology point of all this is feasible, but the question right now is that what is the framework? What is the element? What kind of sec secrecy and what kind of privacy you need to put on each of these data elements can be defined and has to be structured in a place. And to answer your question back, can a training be done? Of course, tra training can be done. Can the interfaces can be simplified? Of course, it can be simplified. And that's the evolution we're working on. I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, no, that that does help. That does help uh, contextualize, and I think it could be a segue to to for me to also ask uh, Dr. Gopal. I think there are a couple of measures that both platforms and doctors could take. Perhaps more training at the at the time of sort of onboarding, um, uh, smoother interfaces, all of that. Uh, but I'm also wondering how far can the law go in in setting out certain standards and in setting out sort of even enforcement mechanisms around around some of these things. Uh, is there a need to granularly sort of prescribe a lot of this in 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 the law? Um, because I know there, there is a reason for why there is sort of principle-based regulation, which is uh, warranted in certain themes and in certain areas. And, and that's the sort of sentiment with the telemedicine practice guidelines as well. There are these broad principles and then there is the detail is left onto the doctor. So if I could call you in to, to just speak about how far do you think the law should go in, in, in this space? Didi, I've given you the gut test uh, under which these practice guidelines were made. Hmm. At that time, when we were grappling with the issues of preparing to face the pandemic, who was having the time for making details? Second thing, it was meant for the follow up patients who were treated by the specialist, as mentioned by Sridhar. It was meant for them. But the industry has taken it as an opportunity, and we have opened floodgates for a lot of platforms, a lot of platforms have come up. If we are creating any platform in the government per se, if I, if I want to make a software for, for a government thing, we are having STQC certification for that. Unless an LT, the QCI accredited STQC certification is uh, got by that software, that is not allowed into allowed to enter into the NIC system. In the private sector also, that kind of regulation is there. The upfront when we are taking some software, we can ask that whether it has been audited for the security or not. Now you are having a lot of agencies who are doing security audits. Everything regulation you talk about law, you are a law student and you talk about law. Ravisha, somebody is there. She will be laughing. You talk about law. There are many laws in the country and many things are to be regulated. But who is having the regulatory capacity to regulate? That's the thing which we are grappling. Yes, having so many laws, even for the digital also, you would be having some laws to regulate this, but we are not aware and we don't have the capacity also. We have to find out that uh, as the things are evolving, now these problems are coming. Now there's a need for enforcing some regulation. But will it solve the problem? We have brought that uh, Clinical Establishment Act for regulating the uh, health institutions and this. It's almost a decade now, and uh, you, you have seen the state of affairs of regulation. 
we have to see that ki how we set the standards so that people they do self regulation rather than bringing an act and regulating and danda mar ke kaam no that is not going to work we have to see that how we regulate ourselves we have to set benchmark if the institutions are there the association will be there they say that you will follow this standards if any vendor is not able to up come to that standard we are not going to buy that uh, this the standards are set that is three rated four rated uh, three star four star five star that kind of starring has also come there is a good system in the uh, uh, government uh, public sector that means the certification standard quality assurance uh, certification is there under qcr quality council of india unless a little a uh, software or a tool which is there <coughs> to be used that meets the standard it is it doesn't come in that you can always build into the security and the privacy uh, privacy aspect into that 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 kind of uh, standards we have to evolve we have to see that what standards are there second thing as i have been rightly pointed out that as the things are evolving we have left lot of the things to the doctors we don't know we we, we can't be prescriptive at that time we have to see that the workforce many of the doctors who were having the private clinics the small clinic they all closed down it has given an opportunity to these people also to see that ki how they can contribute to the uh, ailing patients and other people during this time and many of the private players they have found it as an opportunity uh, the rough estimate is around 55000 crore industry has been opened they have made a you find lot of platforms and everybody is working in silos one of the challenges which we are having for any regulation is how to deal with this silos and the fragments which have which have evolved which have come up you have to see that how to address this issue a lot of silos is there if i want a 24 by 7 or uh, this tele consultation or tele medicine whatever you name it is and nevertheless it's the same thing we don't have the e sanjeevi which platform is there it works from uh, 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock that's the time if somebody falls six at 11 o'clock i don't know specialist services are not there if you talk about any other telemedicine guidelines some other practice has also crept in we have to see that as things are evolving the professional body should come forward and say that these are the minimum things which are there then we can start thinking about uh, coming up with a regulation or a uh, this act otherwise till that time if we bring a regulation people will say that it is not good let the practice let the people have feel how to use it how they can regulate themselves how they can set standards the people who are providing quality standards are they will survive and we are trying to see that like, how we create a network of this uh, platform so that uberization of this can happen and across the country as uh, uma ji has rightly pointed out that no registration is required only one medical register number is would be sufficient to practice across the country there are many issues there things are evolving is hardly two years old baby now you have to see that these are coming and now you see that how it evolves we set standards instead of asking the government to regulate it we start having our own standards see that if the vendor is not meeting to the standard we will not buy that uh, things that kind of things can at least force us to do some regulation they could immediately bringing regulation is not a big deal we can do it in uh, three months but enforcing that where are the capacities whether it will uh, be a public good whether it will uh, do more good than harm that kind of options we don't know things are evolving i'll stop here no fair enough i think uh, i think uh, uh, what you say is very pertinent that, that there's need for sort of more down up uh, bottom up, up up approach rather than handing down very prescriptive uh, one size fits all type type which will not account for a lot of the nuances um, uh, here um i'm i'm also wondering i know when the guidelines had come out uh, there was some uh, scope there to say that for telemedicine there could be you know specialized courses or or a certification that is that is handed out which which might actually equip uh, trainee doctors and doctors to understand this a lot better um and and i dr nambia I, i wonder if you had any thoughts there on on whether this might be the right approach Yes, and actually, actually there were yeah, actually so there were courses conducted for doctors by the TSI and uh, you know DH India was also part of doing that but that is only teaching them about the telemedicine practice guidelines 
and to mm. tell them that it is now legal to practice and that this is what you need to be careful about. How do you make sure that you, you know, at least uh, stick to certain, you know, basic norms that have been dictated, which is about identification and consent and prescription, what you can do, what you cannot do. And to ensure that the fear of, you know, telemedicine is, you know, they are not afraid of practicing it and, and they are comfortable with it. Um, so that, yes, so doctors have been trained to that aspect. And as Mr. Sridhar was pointing out, you know, when we uh, also deploy HIS and EMR systems in the hospitals, the doctors are trained and they are given the training. But so, yes, but uh, as we were just discussing, there has to be an evolutionary process in the basic telemedicine practice guidelines, which, you know, it's all in the process. It's just that because of COVID things have got delayed and it's taken two years, I'm sure. Otherwise, by now, there would have been far more work that could have been done. But um, I'm sure more consultation is happening and more consultative process will evolve. And, you know, discussions like this, which will, uh, you know, tell us as to what the future has to, what we have to do in future. Because the guidelines surely have to improve and we have to uh, bring them to, you know, actually be usable in the normal times and not during just COVID times. Fair enough, yeah. Um, and, and I think maybe maybe on the theme of uh, data, because a lot of you mentioned sort of data as one of the, data and security as one of the key uh, concerns that, that that emerge with the use of, of digital tools. Um, was hoping to uh, uh, get thoughts on just, just the upcoming data protection law. There is one sort of baseline set of principles that is set out there. And this idea of embedding privacy within the very design of, of a lot of the platforms that are uh, emerging, making certain privacy conscious choices throughout the life cycle and if I could ask uh, Sridhar if, if any thoughts on um, how much again the law could could help here what are the kind of initiatives or maybe even choices you've made when developing your product when it comes to um, uh, data protection and data governance allowing seamless flow of data while ensuring privacy. Sure I mean so let me uh, it, let me answer it from the perspective how we approached it then automatically that kind of uh, will answer your question. So the way we looked at is uh, the EHR has been there. We've been there for quite some time, not just because the guidelines have been there for quite some time. What we were embarking out to do was enabling specialist extension to patients at home for the follow-up care. So we were not really looking at uh, reinventing the EHR. The EHR has already been there. So why not we basically use an existing EHR, which has the what you call HIPAA compliance, wherein there's a certain amount of security guidelines already uh, as part of it. I mean, this is what we're talking about before the telemedicine guidelines has come in. I mean, before that. So we wanted certain protection we also design a, a consent format and everything else from, uh, from patient. And primarily because the patient at that point of time, even this privacy, I mean, telemedicine guideline didn't come in about patient being the owner of the data. If you really look at it, every hospital retains it, every diagnostic center retains the patient data. However, the way we configured when we took the EHR, we identified the base level EHR, we said that, well, patient will have a login access and using that, the patient data will be available to patient. And when an assigned doctor, the doctor is assigned to the patient, he'll be able to see the patient data by virtue of the consent which is already taken from the patient. That's how we basically configure it. And then we build on top of the rest of it as how the care workflows, how the protect, how the uh, how the specialist is able to extend his care is what we actually as a mechanism is built onto the platform. So we actually use an existing EHR under which we build the rest of it. And but when we ch our choice of that EHR was based on there is a certain amount of under code. HIPAA guidelines, which actually it's actually adheres to, which is forming a production. Now to answer your question from technology point of view, it's very theoretical, any production is feasible because we have actually high layers of security production on different kind of data, non-medical, which is already available in other sectors, right? So the, question, the, the, the platform is like, okay, with a level of whatever production we want to decide and we want to basically put forward, whether it is by guidelines, whether it's by rules, or whether we as a company wanted to ensure that the patient that is protected, it can easily be implemented. And that's what each and every, I'm sure, uh, uh, practitioner in Telia is actually doing at this point of time. Um, I don't know whether it answers your question. What you're looking at is that what should be the guidelines? Well, what should be the guidelines is, which is a kind of definition which is coming in at this point of time. And primarily with the aim of saying that the patient, I mean, if I'm, if I'm an end user as a patient, I'm actually not here right now, I'm talking about 10 years back or five years back, I go to a diagnosis center. The diagnosis center gives me a hard copy and then retains some part of it. I go to a hospital like Manipal, Manipal retains its patient. 
I, it gives me an ID. I go to uh, some other hospital, like it's CJ or Columbia, Asia, they will have their own ID. Every time I go to different hospitals, I actually put my ID. I really don't have the collection of all the data with myself. What the digital health is permitting today is enabling me to have that. Now the question right now is from a, from a practice point of view, we can actually put in saying that this should be governed by this kind of a privacy, this kind of protection. It is easily doable and it's easily implementable. Yeah. I don't, know whether, that answer, I don't know whether that answers the question. If that is. Yeah. No, that, that helps. And, and I think what, what you said earlier about um, sort of just access controls and managing access as to use it beyond just security, but, but also privacy, some of those choices yeah. help. Um, and, and so we advise a lot of sort of uh, both both B2C and, and B2B platforms around around uh, data generally and then health in particular as well. And I was just wondering if I could quickly bring in Shambhavi from, from my team, uh, maybe just, just to talk about some of the commercial learnings and, and commercial aspects of, of, of what, maybe just to contextualize uh, the, the conversation here, that would be great, Shambhavi. And sure. uh, I'm, I'm just going to just interject, uh, Srinidhi, we have got some great questions as well. So maybe once Shambhavi is done, there are a couple of questions that I think I'd like to pose to all uh, the speakers today, uh, which are more about building the ideal kind of regulatory network. So maybe once Shambhavi is done, I can maybe address some of these questions that Jerry and a few others have posed. Over to you, Sorry. Shambhavi. Yeah, so no, thanks for uh, bringing me in, Shinadi. A couple of clients we've advised have pointed to how you can um, have, say, a master data account. Let's say I'm the head of the family. I have four family members using my my you know mobile phone to to get mental health support or even telehealth support. How do I protect their patient rights? How do I put you know ensure their healthcare data is not corrupted? Um, and we've we've seen some interesting use of you know dashboards and in in app communication um, tools. So things like hanging notifications, things like you know you no know, dashboards where you can grab annually kind of choose what you want to share with whom and under what circumstance. Some cases we've even seen people use OTPs. So let's say my daughter wants to, you know, use the app independently of me at some point. I can't access her data without, um, you know, her keying in the OTP that comes to her phone number. So there are different ways in which you can communicate with, you know, your patients and people using your app that you are privacy compliant, that you are implementing privacy by design, that you know, you aren't um, collecting data on mass just for the sake of collection. Uh, and that there is a reason for every data point being collected. There are ways that you can do it within the user interface, which is something I think Sridhar sir also sort of spoke to in the beginning. Um, and you know, this it's just interesting to see how these are evolving as industry practice in the absence of you know any requirement you know from the law to do so. Um, and it's just been a fascinating exercise, especially with the TPG coming in, especially with digital health tools, uh, you know, coming in and really changing the way you can do home monitoring and remote monitoring of patients. But I will stop here so that, you know, maybe Dr. Priya can look at questions. Can I just uh, uh, make a comment on uh, privacy? Sure. You know, yeah. So this is about, um, uh, you know, I always feel that we cannot just copy the privacy laws that are enacted in the West. We have to do our own laws. Mm -hmm. And simply because if you look at the uh, look at some of our hospitals, when the patients come, there is a whole village, you know, which comes with them and the patient is exposed in public and they're showing their, you know, they're talking in front of them and all of that stuff. When we talk of telemedicine, I mean, on the one end, you have, you know, solutions like what Shambhavi was just mentioning and you have families in Bangalore, Delhi, Bombay, which actually understand this context. You have in villages telemedicine being done where there is a kiosk, there is a kiosk operator and the entire village actually comes there you know, ki doctor sahab se baat karao. And then doctor sahab se baat karao, to, you know, then this whole thing, whether it is, uh, you know, women with a vaginal discharge or a lump in the breast, or there is, you know, or there is a mental illness, it's all being discussed in public. Okay, the, everybody knows. So we need to make sure that we Indianize what our privacy laws are. For us, privacy about some of these things is not a big deal. Maybe, uh, Dr. Priya, if you could take up a couple of the audience questions. till, till Sure, sure. Um, actually, one question actually that uh, is posed by uh, Jerry Bloom, and this is, I think, across uh, perhaps uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Sridhar as well as Dr. Gopal can address this. I mean, his question is, what are the implications for the development of some of these regulations for poorer patients who really can't afford uh, to pay for doctor's care? 
So what are the implications of... Yeah, sorry, I got reform? disconnected, but I think you understood, you got what I was saying. We did, we did. Yeah, um, I, I'm just actually posing a broader audience question to across uh, the panelists. And one of them that's just come up is from Jerry. And he basically asked, what are the implications of the development of some of these newer regulations um, for poorer patients who can't really afford to pay doctors for care? So can telemedicine and digital health in a broader sense support greater equity? Or is it, is it mainly a service for the better off? Um, so perhaps we could kind of, you know, move around the panel to see how you would like to feel this. So why don't we start with Dr. Sridhar and then uh, Dr. Gopal and uh, and Dr. Nambiar. Anyway, I'm not Dr. Sridhar, so you can just yeah, address okay. me as Sridhar. Yeah. So actually, uh, this is a very good question. and. Uh, all both founders in UBK, we strongly feel about that. So that's why we started with follow-up care. Now, if you look at it, how many patients are lost to the hospital post-discharge, like cancer, stroke, or any of the neurological diseases coming from these uh, sectors of what you call tier two or tier three or even villages? You can see Bangalore, a host of these people come from Eastern part of India, Northeast, other Eastern part of India coming to Bangalore. And a lot of these people actually sell their uh, properties and everything else and come here. A lot of times money is over, they go back. Now, half of the uh, problem is only solved. The problem is not that they really are not able to. They're lost, to the, they're lost in the follow of care. Telemedicine, telehealth care makes this very much feasible. Obviously, there's a cost associated. It's not because technology is possible, but there's a cost associated. Whenever there's a cost associated, we assume that somewhere the money is going to come in. Now, the, for example, either it's through the government or through the CSR funding or some mechanism, but the fact of the matter is that the moment the follow-up care is being delivered at the patient's home, the cost automatically reduces. One, there's no travel. Two, they don't really have to spend in, 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 in a city, which is not their own city, where they have to spend a lot of money, not to mention other clinical aspects, other costs. So the cost is automatically reduced. The question right now is that with respect to whatever is being done with respect to follow-up care or if we, when, I, when I'm doing digitization of care, it can, really, it can really reduce the total cost of the care, overall cost of the care. Well, as, as a mechanism, because there is uh, people involved, somebody has to be paid in making the care happen. So some amount of this financing and other aspects can, can come through through other sources and other funding mechanisms, but definitely the cost of care does reduce. Mm. Dr. Rambiar, would you like to kind of take a shot at this question? Sure. Because I, I firmly believe that telemedicine is surely not only, you know, it brings about equity in healthcare, but also improves access. And a lot like what uh, Sridhar said, that also reduces the cost. I mean, just to give you an example, that it's not only just a follow-up, it's also for first consult. You know, when patients are from the tier two, tier three towns, are scouting for specialities and hospitals in a tier one town, they have a much better... Uh, opportunity now to explore digitally, to get their appointments, to get their, uh, you know, uh, investigations reviewed and they're, you know, not to have to repeatedly investigate themselves because um, I've seen how if somebody from, you know, Bihar came to Delhi, he would have a stock of investigations and when they come to Delhi, either they're not being, you know, uh, they will be asked to repeat those tests. They'll say, Ji, hame pata nahi, you know, uh, things like that. And they'll be asked to repeat CT scans and going from one place to the other, either because the films have been spoiled or the storage is not all right. But today you don't have to do multiples of investigation. So your investigation cost for before you reach the actual speciality where you need to be treated is reduced tremendously. And you need to then travel only if required because you don't have to for every small thing come to Delhi. You, you have to, you can get treated in, you know, the local hospitals. So that way you will find that you will introduce more efficiency in the entire system of care and of course reduce the cost as well as you know make it more equitable. And of course I always feel that it will also bring about more transparency and ethics because while what you are doing and it's in the digital format more doctors have access to it, more people have access to it and more reviewers are there there is going to be more transparency and, uh, you know, reduction of cost and not having to repeat multiple investigations will bring about a lot of transparency and eventually increase the trust quotient, which is 
so much depleting now between the patient and the doctor. So, I mean, that's my, my belief in this. Thanks. And Srinidhi, actually, there's one more question. I just thought that... that Rina, you know, let me answer like, this. Yeah, sure. Sure, actually, okay. and I have another question for no, you, Dr. Gopal, as well. Yeah, please go ahead. Regarding yeah. the regulatory thing, if the, the question was, if the regulations come, whether it will affect the cost uh, to the poor or not. Yes. We should uh, understand the landscape of the healthcare system in the country, where each and every person, including me and you, you can walk into any of the government institutions. If you are a person belonging to a poor section, all the cost is free of cost to you. The government will bear the expenses for that, including the high-end uh, investigations. For me and for others, it would have to be a nominal cost, which is far less than the private sector. When these telemedicine guidelines are there, which are already in operation, if you look at the structure, we are having around uh, uh, 1.5, 150,000 uh, travel center, which would be upgraded a health and wellness center. This will be the first contact of the person, rural person, for accessing this uh, medicines and the care. <coughs> this health and wellness centers are enabled through a telemedicine, telemedicine hub or the telemedicine network. Currently, the primary health center they are having, they are connected with the e sanjivni platform, which is a government owned. And daily you would be you would be wondering that okay, what kind of hits this e-sanjini network is happening though it operates from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock but the way it's uh, more than uh, 500 million uh, calls have been made till now so these are all free of cost uh, to the persons who are utilizing it that means even if regulations happen the cost for the poor or the deprived section is not going to be there it will be free of cost to these people i will stop here for this question Thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Gopal. There are one or two other questions that will probably be directed to you and the others. Trinidhi, would you like to go ahead with those? Uh, sure, sure. I think uh, there was one question on, uh, is there any recommendation or law to, uh, to uh, in India for AI filter clinics, like a, like a general practice service, which could automate- yeah, I have already them. answered that thing uh, in the question answer section. Oh. There, currently, there are no recommendations. Right, right. And I think another question on integration as well, you, you've taken... I've already answered that thing and uh, it's visible to that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I think another question that we would love to hear everyone's perspective on was was just how could maybe regulators help infuse uh, trust in, in digital health tools, be it, be it apps or software or wearables or, or you know, other, other such platforms. Will a thorough vetting process for, for apps or digital platforms used in healthcare help should they be regulated as as medical devices is there a need to tweak the current uh, law um, any any thoughts on that question to all all panelists here uh, maybe if we could start with uh, mr Sridhar and and then uh, sure. see actually uh, it's an interesting question see anytime anything new happens you actually look at the whole gamut uh, of all the areas and they could be the trust element becomes a problem essentially uh, you don't ask such a question if if, so it's, we, we talked about it, the virtual infrastructure versus physical infrastructure. But you don't ask such a question of physical infrastructure, primarily because the doctor's certification is there. There is a medical council which is actually certifying the doctor duty. The drugs which the person is actually buying is also certified. There's a, there's a mechanism there, right? Which is, which is all there. Now, the, 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 the basic thing is that underlying the communication which is happening between the doctor and the patient, which is a digital health care platform which you're putting in. What are the kind of things which needs to be put into practice so that a trust comes in is the mechanism which needs to be get in, right? Now, like Dr. Manambir uh, talked about it up front, that just by sharely putting in a list of uh, people in the regular, in, into a list will not be uh, probably good enough. The, the, the question right now is that there is, a data, there is a data protection, something which is required. So maybe some sort of a certification or some sort of a mechanism of, let's say like, like what you have for uh, uh, ISO standard or something, when somebody takes it automatically, there'll be some mechanism with that. So that kind of can, could be an act. So likewise, you can have some guidelines to do that. But if it cannot be something which, uh, which, is, uh, which, and which actually puts too much uh, too much uh, emphasis on, uh, let's say, like uh, 
you you have to pass some sort of a, you, you have to get us get some sort of a regulation to actually go and get a signature to do it that that way speaking then uh, all the innovation everything else will get be cut cut it. i mean it, it cannot be some sort of a you need to apply for something and then get in return so it could be self uh, there could be a certain thing like iso standards or something which we can put in and then uh, definitely a list of all this uh, approved software vendors over there if if a uh, thing will be there will definitely help i believe it's question of enabling a trust in the system and some mechanism of when the trust comes in everything will automatically uh, work towards uh, making the right things is what i believe uh dr nambiar would you would you like to come in as well on on this uh, yeah so um one is you know we have to understand that when we say use of digital technology it is not going to be like we should not be doing a copy paste of what we do in the paper world okay we must use the digital technology for its ability to improve the efficiencies of the system so that is very important and that is what we all have to in the healthcare system also understand like as a doctor i shouldn't say that this is how i do it now so as the emr vendor you create the screens like this and do this process so that's important the other thing is that yes regulators what has to happen is yes there has to be a hand holding there has to be guidelines but it cannot be dictatorial it cannot be restrictive it it can be enhancing and we should refrain from pasting you know copying whatever the western world has done because there are innumerable problems in the digitized world which they use in the healthcare sector we need to make sure that we use our capability i mean indians have the best capability in terms of creating the it solutions and we should create our own system which get followed by the world and not the other way around and i think you know our ndhm the entire movement is something that the whole world is watching so how to make it more robust it is not through restrictive uh, acts but through enhancing guidelines and to see how we can improve the collaboration between the tech world and the healthcare world because at this moment what we find is that the healthcare worker has to listen to what the technology developer says that this is like you know it's like so the healthcare has to work for the tech that has been developed it should be the other way around tech has to develop for healthcare rather than health to practice as tech fair enough yeah um and 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 dr gopal as well if if you'd like to also come in on this uh, and i did see there were there were a couple of other questions also which which you responded to one, one being just this question of capacity even if we were to have a you know vetting process and and i'm hearing from both both mr shridhar and dr nambia that might not be the way to go very prescriptive but 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 would love to hear your thoughts especially from from the perspective of capacity building as well i will just pick up from where the waji has left that is the practice needs to be built into technology not the vice versa so main thing is that the technology try to push the practice uh, as a result the conflict arises we do have uh, the health technology assessment which is still evolving under department of health uh, department of uh, health research uh, under ministry of health so that thing is evolving and uh, if you look at the staffing pattern there so it's lot needs to be done there right now they are just doing the costing of packages and other thing it was uh, designed to be like uh, the things which we have witnessed in thailand and south korea now it is moving in that direction when whatever uh, things are coming the if we want i want a health technology solution to be included into pmj right now their focus is on bringing in the packages into the pmj program so they are just focusing on that but slowly and slowly this would be added during the covid time you see that how the department of health research they have evaluated the the uh, this your diagnostic kits and as a result you have seen a, a lot of change in the the way which the treatment and the sorry in which the prices of the this diagnostic kit they have come down because the evaluation the other things it has evolved but still for having a technology based solution for evolving this kind of thing though we have a natural innovation mission at our base so which nurtures the startups and other things but for evaluating the health technology per se the capacities you have to see that how we build that capacities a lot of work is to be done on that 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Gopal. And, and and I think a quick follow up question there perhaps could be on um, on within the current drugs and cosmetics act framework. Also, there is a committee that is, um, I believe, looking at sort of revamping it, addressing, examining what what more needs to be done. So I was wondering if if the panel also had thoughts on what could be the priority areas for for the committee to look at when when we're thinking of drugs and cosmetics as an umbrella framework for also devices and and products. Um, and, and just on capacities of the existing drug controlling authorities? Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer because a uh, lot of things uh, which are discussed uh, can't be shared here. So I can't be sharing that thing because what has transpired regarding the Medical Devices Act and other things is very difficult for me to answer this question. I'm sorry for that. No, no, I, I completely appreciate that. I think uh, I was also trying trying my luck there with, with, with that <laughs> But but would love to hear from Dr. Nambiyal and Mr. Sridhar as well, perhaps on what their expectations would be from uh, from this uh, redesign. So let me uh, talk to you about the medical devices. I mean, you know, just like how in the last two years we've seen a plethora of telemedicine solutions, we've also seen innumerable apps and the IoTs that are just mushrooming. And it's like you know, every app you you know uh, upload one and uh, un you install one and uninstall four every day, right? It's almost that kind of you know scenario now. You have so many available, and there are no standards which you know many of them are there to. Some of them, not because they don't want to, but because they do not know where to go look for and what are the standards. And it is nobody's fault that we don't have those standards in place as yet because these are all things in evolution. So what will happen is over the next three, four years, I think the ones that are not um, adhering to certain guidelines or are not keeping themselves ready to adapt to the evolving guidelines, they are going to you know, go out of the system. But the next three, four years, we will have to live with a lot of breaches. Okay, We will have to live with chaos. We might have to live with solutions that we have bought and we'll have to discard. So we will have to pay a price. A lot of us will have to pay some price. Hopefully, it will, may not be too serious because, you know, it's uh, it's in that uh, over the next three four years, I think a lot of things will fall in place because it the work is happening in that in in that line. And I'm sure Dr. Gopal is so much aware. He's not telling us, but of course, it's all happening, and it will all be in place. You know, these uh, standards will be in place. What everybody has to see is, I mean, the developers, the technology developers, as well as users like us, we have to understand that we might be using something which is going to be short-lived. And there will, of course, be a lot of, you know, um, big players that will come in and, you know, all that will happen. But yes, we, we have to be ready for this, this living out this chaotic period. Yeah, I, yeah. I definitely I agree with that. And only, only thing which I can put in forward is that definitely we don't want to have medical devices covered under drugs and pharmaceutical acts because they are two different things. So how exactly this is going to come about and which way it is come about is something we'll wait and watch, like what Dr. Gopal has mentioned. Thing is, however, innovation is curtailed with more and more regulations. The more regulations you put in, the innovations will get curtailed. Today, for example, going to the whatever certain circumstances we are today, the world where it is, there's a lot of opportunities in actually coming about and getting a lot of these uh, things in digital healthcare. What has happened in other, other, other areas in IT and other world can really touch the healthcare space and how we can actually nurture and capture that is something uh, the rules and regulations will actually guide. So definitely uh, one can look at it. I'm sure, I mean, it's just, uh, it's not a rocket science and that's what probably is happening. And, it is going to evolve and I'm sure that uh, we will have spaces of saying that, okay, there's variables which are not actually doing much. There, But on the other end of it, there, there are things which are actually touching the body and doing something directly to the patient. So there could be different guidelines uh, which can emerge there and I'm sure that that must have been taken. In. So if if it can be put into the right shape, innovations will, will really come about and change the whole paradigm of the way we know about in the way patient and doctors, uh, doctors are practicing medical health. Yeah, I have to say that what you're saying, Sridhar, about this innovation thing, because we've seen in the last two years, the amount of innovation that has happened in digital technology or digital health, we've mm -hmm. never seen it before. We have... Um, 
Yeah, I, I think there's a bit of a lag. I think we may have lost uh, Dr. Nambia there. Um, I, while she while she rejoins, maybe I'm also mindful of the time. I think we're yes. uh, close to the end. So I, I, I'd I really like for everyone to, I guess, weigh in on, uh, given the scale, I think given the scale that, that Dr. Nambia was also alluding to, what might be your uh, wish list, say, for the for the laws and policies? Maybe three top points that... Uh, that that you could share with us on what what you'd like to see in the law and policy framework for an enabling uh, regime. Uh, if maybe again I could ask uh, Mr. Sridhar to weigh in first, and and then Dr. Nambiar, and and then I'll uh, go to Dr. Kupar. So basically, the key thing here is that uh, how enabling the trust in this area would be uh, primarily. I'm sure that's what the government's addressing also is the uh, personal data protection, whatever, how, wh what are the things which needs to get take care of that can actually come by fast enough, uh, where it, with a single legislation which can deal with the personal data will definitely be of help to us, okay? The second would be like, uh, uh, the question right now is that, uh, what is the scope? I mean, Dr. Nambia uh, 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 alluded to that. Um, today, for example, how does, uh, what is the difference between one state practicing in another state and what are the limits about, about that? How, how are the practitioners going to my, practice across different state boundaries? What is the clarity? If that something can come about there, that will help. And uh, of course, uh, uh, because this is again uh, bringing trust into the element, what kind of a certification process for having the digital healthcare service providers as a, as a repository? Uh, what kind of guidelines can work in that so that uh, people, I mean, you, you can actually build on top of that is what I believe uh, immediately would be of uh, focus to uh, companies like us. So, you know, I, I feel that, you know, a few things. One is that the entire culture of innovation that has seen, you know, a, a real increase in the last two years. I think our country needs to make sure that we encourage innovation and we encourage financial support for young innovators and also the domain specific knowledge experts and platforms which should be there because many of them are working in isolation and I think that um, the culture of uh, innovation has to be encouraged and there has to be uh, that is something that the government should look at. Second thing I feel is that in our education in the medical nursing and um, health technical education there is really no emphasis on digital health uh, related education. And it has to be done on an urgent basis. You know, if supposing somebody has to introduce it as a subject in the final year or in the nursing informatics or a medical informatics, it has to be as an undergraduate subject. So that when the, when the students pass out, they know it's, it becomes normal practice. It's not something which is coming, which they have to learn again. And uh, so that's something which I feel is mandatory. And the third thing is that there has to be an environment where the technical partners and the healthcare domain partners have a larger uh, platform to interact, to, to really understand. I'm a technical developer when, you know, today they want to start developing a solution or a device, they go because they have a story in their own family. It's not because it is the need as felt by a doctor or a nurse, but if they have an interactive session if they have you know ways where they can go to the hospitals they can understand from a nurse how her life could be made easier they would do it better rather than saying i went to the hospital to show my child i saw a nurse was doing like this and i developed a solution it could be better if there is much more. and sh surely the uh, healthcare people also you know they, they become more open-minded about discussing with the technology partners so i think even at college levels we need to have these kind of interactions you know, so that that is important in my view. Uh, thanks, yes. thanks, Sridhar and, and Dr. Nambiar and I and do, uh, Dr. Gopal has just messaged that he's uh, has to leave for another session. So maybe we'll just get the closing remarks from him, so he can uh, he can kind of uh, move on to his next session. Okay, thank you, Priya, and uh, after listening to that, uh, let the things evolve rather than regulating it. Yeah. Because the moment you start regulating the innovations and the other things which can come in, they will be just, uh, you will be killing the innovations. You will be killing that innovations. In two years, you have seen a lot of innovations. People have come with new ideas, how to reach it. We are having a lot of proposals every day. Okay, how to how to use the, uh, this uh, telemedicine network in the health and wellness centers. 
they are coming with the different solution we don't know which kind of solution which we which would for which part of the geography would fit which part of the other aspects would be useful for the uh, different set of patients we don't know let the things evolve till the time i think we should not be talking about regulation too early to talk about regulation because nothing wrong has happened till now we have left it to all and when the things are evolving you see lot of innovations coming in and uh, then it, that the best practices can be adopted elsewhere as well i will stop here only that's my only thing <coughs> okay thank you i have to attend a empowered group meeting so i have to leave it uh, thank you very much okay thanks thank you thank you so much dr gopal thank you dr your... gopal you have to stay connected yeah um great i think we were also close to the end of time um thank you thank you so much mr shridhar dr dr nambia for your time really enjoyed this conversation i think a couple of sort of quick thoughts just just summarizing everything that we've discussed and i'll just probably start with with what dr gopal said i guess adding more laws might not be the solution every time and and that's a very comforting thought honestly i mean uh, even as a lawyer i'm happy to happy to say that i mean uh, would would look towards more enforcement perhaps of existing laws look for more bottom up industry standards as the as the way to go forward um i think dr nambiar made a couple of interesting remarks on tech should develop for healthcare not not the other way around encouraging any regulation should encourage innovation financial support for innovators and and this theme of law or guidelines need not be should not be overly prescriptive but rather uh, enabling and the need to have more digital literacy and also literacy curriculum within within colleges schools um, starting starting from the ground up um mr shridhar made a lot of interesting remarks i think on on infusing trust uh, to see how the personal data protection framework could help uh, move this conversation forward some type of certification process perhaps for uh, service providers and vendors to to help build uh, trust uh, ideal in an ideal world medical devices should not be regulated in the same way as 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 drugs because it's completely different regimes and again this overarching underlying theme of of enabling regulation which uh while ensure sort of patient outcomes but but it's also permitting innovation to to arise um and and with that i think i'll i'll conclude and and thanks so much for your for your time everyone and I'll probably hand over now to uh professor jerry bloom for his uh closing remarks well okay i mean i guess i've had the privilege of of joining this meeting from the uk and i have to say i found the discussion very inspiring um and 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 very encouraging really um it, it's clear there are major opportunities for digital health but i guess you've all said there are potential problems and the story i heard is over a number of years a gradual build up of digital infrastructure with the covid emergency a game changer and almost explosive accelerated change very rapid development of a highly fragmented ecosystem and then from everyone saying there's a need for rules need to clarify roles and responsibility need to build trust really need for some governance arrangements but then there is a tension on the one hand the need to leave room for a lot of innovation but the need to get more rules and more clarity on who is responsible for what so a very challenging situation and um also from particularly dr gopal talked about the highly innovative roles of high innovation that's happened but the limited enforcement capacity and he also emphasized again you know in a situation of rapid change rules and regulations can have good impact but they may have unintended bad impact and so one has to be cautious about rules thinking they're the key solution um and in the end the need for an evolutionary approach and Dr Nambiar is saying there are no blueprints there is no perfect model to be imported and India with its very innovative tech sector and innovative medical sector may be able to take a lead in thinking through the new approaches but that brings big challenges and i guess i just want to make a couple comments i think for i work on health systems as does priya and for us it's really excellent to be able to hear the voices of lawyers of government officials of managers of large facilities of of tech entrepreneurs voices not usually heard in the health systems world but then i sort of and and we heard the complexity of the different points of view and how they can find a way of working together to build this 
governance arrangement, this trust, while change is so rapid. Of course, there were people who weren't here. And I guess I have to mention that patients weren't in this discussion. And clearly their view, if we're talking about privacy, we're talking about equity of access, we're talking about quality of services are important. And only certain providers are here, as, as Dr. Gopal said in the end. Yes, there's the government primary health care facilities are key providers. Their voices haven't been here. But in a discussion about the new governance arrangements, somehow all those voices will have to be there. And then I was very pleased to see a comment in the chat well, I'll read what it says. We need to develop forums at a global level where practitioners, innovators, business professionals, regulators, and researchers work on a single platform and inform policy. And I think from what Gop Dr. Gopal said, on the one hand, people want regulations. On the other hand, some regulations may have negative impacts and the rapid change is so quick we can't predict. And I think that comes to people like Priya and ourselves and why we have established a platform for research and mutual learning on management of mixed health systems. Because for, in this kind of process of rapid evolutionary change, there's a need for systematic assessment of what works, what works badly, what works well, and how to move forward. And I guess I would end this by saying there's a real agenda here for getting some systematic learning, um, particularly in a period of rapid change. And I think there's a responsibility now for the research community to contribute to the work, the really excellent work you're doing. And I think I'll leave it there, but pointing out that Priya is probably a key contact for this forum, and she may want to say something about how people can get in touch. So thank you very much for an excellent, excellent uh, discussion. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, please do join us uh, to be part of the mutual learning platform. I've left uh, uh, the web page uh, uh, URL on the chat and I will leave my, um, um, uh, I, I'll ensure that my uh, email details are reached out to all of uh, you all have registered as well. This has essentially become a movement for mixed health systems and we are delighted to have these kind of dialogues where diverse stakeholders from across the health systems um, make uh, valid points about the future of health and how we can write our own futures when it comes to healthcare from the global south. Um, so stay tuned uh, for our next dialogue where we'll talk a little bit more about scale integration. And here we will bring the, the, the most uh, uh, crucial aspects of healthcare, the, the patient voices um, uh, to kind of bring forth their views on what it means to navigate digital health in the future. What does it mean as a patient and what does it mean as vulnerable populations? So thank you so much for your time. And once again, I'd like to thank all the speakers of today's session for a fantastic debate and their valuable time. Thank you again, Dr. Nambiar, uh, Mr. Thank Sridhar, you so much. and uh, Mr. Gopal. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.